It always feels good when you are appreciated. SLT Non-Stop Broadband. Free loyalty data added as you stay connected. Link at the time of the day, you will be able to get the money. Mom, what do you want? Tonight, taking a stand, Sri Lanka digs its heels in at the UN Security Council. There are no two post-conflict situations where similar prescriptive remedies can be applied. Timelines evolved externally in achieving stated objectives would only seek to hinder the process of reconciliation since they would be bereft of ground realities. Met with coughs, former ambassador to Russia Udyanga Viratunga remanded. Some reprieve. The United National Party hammers out its issues as internal factions arrive at a consensus on party alliance symbol. All that and much more coming up on First at Nine, this Friday, the 14th of February, 2020. From Ada Derana, this is Ada Derana First at Nine. Okay, hari ini saya anu hati terasa ni sekarang. Rupiah milia na tu nak mula dengan ke upah kerana dia nak ni. Aku rute muka siap time save kerana. From Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening and welcome to First at Nine. I'm Dhamke Kanayaka. Let's start with the local stories. Sri Lanka has refused to agree to any external deadlines to achieve its goals in the post-war reconciliation process. Sri Lanka's permanent representative of the United Nations, Shanuka Seniviratna, said that external forces who impose timelines lack knowledge on ground realities and therefore deadlines given to achieve reconciliation would in fact hinder the process. She also highlighted that there are no two post-conflict situations where similar prescriptive remedies can be applied given each experience is unique to the relevant country. Her remarks came as she addressed the UN Security Council's open debate titled Peace Building and Sustaining Peace, Transnational Justice in Conflict and Post-Conflict situations. An open debate of the United Nations Security Council on the role of transnational justice was conducted yesterday. The Security Council meeting on peace building and sustaining peace, transitional justice in conflict and post-conflict situations was chaired by President of the Security Council for the month of February, Philip Kofan. In her remarks, Sri Lanka's permanent representative to the UN, Shenuka Seneviratna, hit home the importance of the island being left to complete its post-war reconciliation process as external elements who impose timelines lack knowledge on simple ground realities. Sri Lanka aligns itself with the statement made by Azerbaijan on behalf of the non-aligned movement. Sri Lanka's engagement today is in keeping with the government's vision for a country that embodies the universal values of human rights, justice, rule of law and good governance while ensuring economic dividends to its people. Madam President, you would no doubt agree that the post-conflict milieu of each country is unique. There are no two post-conflict situations where similar prescriptive remedies can be applied. Comparative experiences of countries which have traversed the path of post-conflict transition and reconciliation have often made deliberate efforts to maintain a balance between the speed of the transitional justice process and the desired standard, which includes inclusiveness, comprehensiveness and sustainability. The basic tenet of a transitional justice process is the application of its theoretical principles on state obligations. It is a state that needs to pursue truth, justice, reparations and guarantees of non-recurrence. The newly elected President of Sri Lanka, President Gotabe Rajapaksa, pledged to work towards guaranteeing the human rights and political and economic freedom for the people in a truly democratic country. In this context, he espoused that every citizen of Sri Lanka has the right to live freely and securely holding independent opinions, following the religion of choice and freedom of association and assembly, as these are rights of human beings that no one can challenge. Action by the Sri Lankan security forces during the conflict was against a group designated as a terrorist organization by many countries and even described as ruthless by some and not aimed at any community in the country. The modus operandi of suicide attacks by this terrorist group, which for the first time in recent history deliberately targeted 
civilians have now been adopted expansively by similar groups globally. It is therefore appropriate that when seeking mechanisms of transitional justice, related simple theories would need to take cognizance of the various historical, cultural, and religious sensitivities. Further, timelines evolved externally in achieving stated objectives would only seek to hinder the process of reconciliation since they would be bereft of ground realities. Promoting a peaceful, just, and reconciled society is not only an object in itself, but also a prerequisite for a sustainable and inclusive approach to development that leaves no one behind. As a sovereign state, Sri Lanka will continue to establish its own priorities to this end. In our experience, while certain lessons can be learned from others, it is imperative to chart our own path to reconciliation in order for it to be sustainable. Sri Lanka is therefore committed to find innovative and pragmatic solutions driven by the domestic context to protect the country's national interest, guided by the provisions of the constitution and the will of the citizens expressed through democratic means. In this context, Sri Lanka looks forward to continue its cooperation with the international community through capacity building and technical assistance in mutually agreed areas in keeping with domestic priorities and policies. Now, Deputy Director General of Education, Training and Research of the Library of the Ministry of Health, Dr. Sunil Dialvis reveals that Sri Lankan nurses have a good opportunity to fill the vacancies created in the UK's nursing sector following Brexit. His comments came during the Nursing Research Symposium, which was worked off recently in Colombo. The biological, chemical, biological, radioactive and nuclear disasters and accidents, so therefore, you have to be ready with that also. How to handle these things? Previously not heard, not practiced, and even not taught. So therefore, the nursing profession should evolve in such a way that it is ready to face these challenges. And time to time, assess where we stand. We have to fill the gaps in nursing care, not only the quantity, also the quality of nurses. So last week, I was invited by the British High Commission to have a meeting to how to arrange employment of Sri Lankan nurses in UK because they have um, left the, the European Union. Now they have 40,000 vacancies in UK for nurses. So last week, I was in Human Resource Conference in Thailand. So the representative of UK told me, that you take that opportunity so we will interact with you so that we have to work out how to do it. We work down, uh, organized in a such a way that each and every category, not only healthcare professional, others also who are related to research activities pertaining to health also invited. Meanwhile, during the symposium, Director General of Health Services Dr. Anil Jasinghe revealed details of some research projects he gave the go-ahead recently. The maximum residual levels, we call them MRL, maximum residual levels of lead in rice. Of course, according to so-called Codex Alimentarius, there are levels defined by Codex. But the issue is the portion of rice taken by various communities differ. If you take European eating rice and Sri Lankan eating rice, it's totally different. So there cannot be a one single maximum residual level of lead for entire world. Then the other thing is we have various types of rice. So you have to uh, sample all these types of rice and we have to generalize. So that is one research item. The other one, if you take biscuits, for that matter, any food item in the industry, there is a regular portion that one takes during a day. How many biscuits you eat? Depending on how many biscuits you eat, the nutrients, the good things and the bad things we get through biscuits depends on the quantity that we eat. So right now, this portion of various food items one consumes is decided by the food industry, not by us. So for the food industry, you eat more, they get more profit. So therefore, 
we decided to assess the portion of various food items that we consume on average. Now, former Ambassador to Russia, Udayanga Virutunga, today was remanded until the 17th of February by the Colombo Fort Magistrates Court. The former ambassador was arrested by the Criminal Investigation Department earlier this morning when he arrived at the Bandarnak International Airport on board a Sri Lankan Airlines flight. The former ambassador was interrogated and subsequently produced before the Colombo Fort Magistrates Court a few hours ago. The former ambassador had successfully evaded arrest after a warrant was issued on the 20th of October 2016 by court with regards to embezzlement of public funds when procuring MIG aircraft and money laundering. Previously, Viratunga had also been intercepted in the UAE on the 4th of February 2018 when he attempted to leave for the United States. He was subsequently released by the UAE authorities but was prevented from leaving the territory of the UAE until the conclusion of the investigations. Now the coronavirus death toll mounts in China as it now stands at 1,380, while the global total of infections is placed at 64,435. Chinese officials say that six health workers have also died from the new coronavirus within the country, with over 1,700 health workers being among the infected. In the meantime, the 33 Sri Lankan students who returned from the city of Wuhan in China was, and who was quarantined at the Dietalao army camp were released this morning. Following the coronavirus outbreak, 33 Sri Lankans living in Wuhan, China were brought down to the island and was kept under strict quarantine for 14 days in a special unit set up in the Dietalao army camp. The group of 33 were released from quarantine today due to them not having shown any symptoms of the coronavirus during the 14-day isolation period. The death toll from the coronavirus has now risen to at least 1,383, including three outside mainland China. Mainland China has recorded 5,090 more cases of the novel coronavirus, bringing the global total to 64,435. Officials say six health workers have died from the novel coronavirus in China and more than 1,700 are among infected. According to Chinese government, the spike in cases was due to a change in how cases are tabulated. The government say the total will now include clinically diagnosed cases, people who demonstrate all the symptoms of COVID-19 but have either been unable to access a test or are believed to have falsely tested negative. China's state-owned medical products maker is collecting plasma from the blood of recovered people after discovering it helped critically ill patients. China National Biotech Group has been using this plasma, which contains highly potent antibodies, to treat more than 10 seriously ill patients since the 8th of this month. Two more Japanese people have tested positive for the novel coronavirus. It brings the total number of coronavirus patients in Japan to 257, of which 219 are from the Diamond Princess cruise ship. Now moving on with other local stories, President Gotabe Rajpakshi is focused on developing highways and expressway network island-wide to ensure easy transportation, avoiding traffic. Further, the President's attention was drawn on allocating vehicular parking in Colombo, which is also an issue the country's financial capital is faced with. President Gotabe Rajapaksa held a meeting this morning with top officials of the Ministry of Roads and Highways. In the meeting, the President advised the officials to construct the Central Expressway and other expressways immediately. Further officials were instructed to reopen the first phase of the Matarahambantut Expressway, which was partially completed after making necessary completions. The President also advised the officials to immediately complete the Ingiria Ratnapura main road and add it to the National Expressway network. Officials were also informed to take measures to avoid traffic in main roads leading to Colombo. The necessary advice was provided by the President to the officials to inspect the ability of constructing a road to Bataramulla via Dimitagoda and Vanathamulla as a solution to avoid traffic in Buralla and Rajagiriya junctions. 
Attention was also drawn by the president on constructing vehicle parking facilities for those reaching Colombo with the help of Urban Development Authority. विस्सा श्रीलंका The premier made these remarks while taking part in a ceremony worked off to award scholarships uh, to children of migrant workers at Temple Trees. Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa took part in a ceremony to mark scholarships being awarded to children of migrant workers as part of the Western Province Scholarship Program at the Temple Trees premises today. Sri Lanka Videsh Seva ni tukare hanse dia badin chuela videsh ra kiya sanda pitatwe ana samikiyan ge daruwanta अध्यापन लीम संधा शिष्यत्मत्वपन कर शक्ति Welcome back. You're watching First at Nine. The father of the Shangri-La suicide bomber during the Easter Sunday attacks of last year and six others were further remanded today after they were produced before court. In the meantime, Defence Secretary Major General Kamal Gunaratne lamented the loss of freedom Sri Lankans suffered on top of heinous loss of life following the heinous attacks. Businessman Mohammad Ibrahim, the father of the suicide bomber responsible for the Shangri-La bombing, and six other suspects were arrested from the area of Mahavila in Demetagoda by the CID. Producing the suspects before court today, the CID sought their further remand, as investigations are still not concluded. Accordingly, the Colombo Additional Magistrate Tanuja Lakmali Jayatunga ordered that the suspects be further remanded until the 28th of February. Meanwhile speaking at an event at the Pannipitiya Dharmapala Vidyalaya Defence Secretary Major General Kamal Gunaratne lamented the people's loss of freedom which the country fought for over decades owing to the Easter Sunday attacks Prabhakaran kiyala tibuna kal eka dawasakadi singhala minissunta hama deyakma sati deken natta sati tunen amataka wenawa kiyala pasugiya pasku irida mulu ratama udu yadikuru una nidahase gaman giya ape rata wasiyan daruwan hama kenekma bishaneyen veli giya kisi kenek eliyata bahinna baya una mechchara kapa kirimak kala mechchara nidahase bera gatta rata mokakda me une wacana dekak ageyanna eka wacanayak pallehata daapu ege pratipalaya wacana deka thamai प्रजातंत्रवाद सह संहिंदिया प्रजातंत्रवाद सह संहिंदिया के वचन दिखट इता इहल तत्व लबादेन जाति का आरक्षा वकीन वचन बीमट मदाल पागल दापुन सातम अपेरटे अहिंसक मिनीसु विदेश के अंकी पद अतुल देशीय अणुगणना बल्लु बलू अगे मेरी लगी तवत्सिय गान क्रोहल इन्े अगकिंगे जाति का आरक्षा वे वेदगत कम पिलिबद नुदन कम सिद्वेच आवासनावंत सिद्धिया 
Now, turning our attention to politics, the problems United National Party had been having recently over symbol of their new alliance looks to be coming to an end. Both factions of leader Ranil Vikram Singh and opposition leader Sajid Premadasa had face-to-face -face talks, following which both sides seems, seemed content. Meanwhile, political sources say that the General Secretary of the new UNP-led alliance has requested the Election Commission to accept the swan as its symbol. A meeting between factions of UNP leader Ranil Vikramasinghe and opposition leader Sajid Premadasa was held at Sirikota this afternoon with the objective of finalising the formation of the new alliance. Although the meeting was scheduled to be held in the morning, only about 40 MPs of the UNP parliamentary group turned up, excluding party leader Ranil Vikramasinghe and General Secretary Akhila Viraj Karyavasam. In the meeting held later, Party General Secretary Akhila Viraj Karyavasam, Party's national organiser Navin Desanayake, Ravi Karunanayake and John Amaratunga participated representing Ranil Vikramasinghe faction. Representing Sajid faction MPs Kabir Hashim, Ranjit Madhuma Bandara, Mangala Samaravira and Malik Samaravikrama were in attendance. Sir Anupahak Mahari, Sir the Nam Saturu and Vidhiata, Lanjane Gana, Sartaka Pisaka Chakra. A Vikalpa Padeka Gana Pisaka Chakra, Vikalpa de Gana, me parso decama, Sahimaka Patino. Akata Sartakai, the Golome Katagranti Negalatino. Our son of the Indugatawa, Nitian Kulu Katu to our Sankala, Api, Madi de Samandu Prakashkarna, Munakaring, Harimunar Lakuna Karang, Shakti Matu, Ekamutu Tarankarna. Api Samandu. According to party sources, both factions had agreed to contest under the banner Samagi Jana Balavegya, led by opposition leader Sajid Premadasa. Sources also say that a committee of attorneys were appointed to look into the legal aspect in contesting under the symbol of elephant or the new Democratic Front symbol, the Swan. Its decision is set to be announced next Monday. Meanwhile, Secretary-General of the Samagijana Balavegya MP Ranjit Madhuma Bandara has requested the Election Commission to accept the Swan as the party symbol. Now, manufacturing Purchasing Managers Index expanded at a slower pace in January this year, recording an index value of 54, mainly due to the slow expansion in new orders and stocks of purchases. Sub-indices of new orders, production and stock of purchases expanded at a slower pace, particularly in the manufacturing of food and beverages sector, with a decreasing demand after the festival season. A slowdown in stock of purchases in textile and wearing apparel sector could also be observed due to Chinese New Year holidays. Employment, meanwhile, contracted during the month due to employees leaving their jobs for better paid employment. Furthermore, a significant lengthening of suppliers' delivery time was experienced, especially in manufacturing of textile and wearing apparel sector, owing to the new coronavirus outbreak in China since early January. All sub-indices of PMI manufacturing except employment exceeded the threshold of 50, indicating neutral, signalling an overall expansion in manufacturing activities during the month of January 2020. Although the manufacturers, especially related to apparel, apparel sector, can cautioned that new coronavirus outbreak would disrupt the global supply chain overall, expectations for manufacturing activities for the next three months remain slightly improved compared to last month. Now, outgoing Governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, feels that Britain needs to preserve flexibility for rulemaking in the financial sector as it leaves EU trading rules behind. Britain left the EU last month but will apply the bloc's rules until December, after which new trading terms will be needed. Carney said that it would be strange if Britain were to outsource rulemaking and supervision to another jurisdiction. I think the UK has to, and these are decisions for the UK government to make, but the UK has to look at these, uh, the future relationship with Europe 
uh, in the context of its future relationship with the relationships with the rest of the world. Uh, and if I take an example of the financial sector where we have special responsibility as the Bank of England, it's the world's leading international financial center, it's the most complex uh, center in the world. Uh, it would be very strange if uh, we were to outsource the rulemaking and effectively the supervision of that financial sector uh, to another jurisdiction. However competent that jurisdiction is, however important that jurisdiction is, whether it's Europe or the United States. So uh, we do need to preserve uh, a degree of flexibility in our rulemaking. Now taking a look at the markets, Sri Lankan stocks closed. 0.48% lower today for the sixth continuous day dragged down by food and tobacco counters. The All Share Price Index closed at 28.09 points down at 5,829.21. The S&P SL20 Index meanwhile closed 11.86 points up at 2,779.76. The market turnover was a 427.42 million rupees, while 36 stocks gained and 109 fell. Ceylon Tobacco Company closed 14 rupees, 40 cents down at 1,300, make that 1,135 rupees and 50 cents a share, contributing most to the ASPS fall. Meanwhile, in the currency market, Sri Lankan rupee closed weak at 181 rupees and 45 to 52 cents to the US dollar in the spot market, while bond yields gained. However, the rupee closed at 181 rupees and 42 to 48 cents to the greenback yesterday. Now, let's take a look at how the Sri Lankan rupee performed during the day against other major currencies around the world. We'll see you again shortly. Welcome back. You're watching First at Nine. Now, Antarctica, where people expect to encounter very cold weather, is now warmer than expected. Temperature there has exceeded 20 degrees Celsius for the first time after researchers logged a temperature of 20.75 degrees Celsius on an island off the coast of the continent. Scientists say that they had never seen a temperature this high in Antarctica. Antarctica also hit a record last week with temperature reading of 18.3 degrees Celsius on the Antarctic Peninsula. This latest reading was taken at a monitoring station on Seymour Island, part of a chain of islands of the same peninsula at the north northernmost point of the continent. Although the temperature is a record high, the reading is not part of a wider study and it alone cannot be used to predict a trend. According to the UN's World Meteorological Organization, temperatures on the Antarctic continent have risen by almost 3 degrees Celsius over the past 50 years and that about 87% of the glaciers along its west coast have retreated in that time. Last month was also Antarctica's warmest January on record. U.S. prosecutors have accused Huawei of stealing trade secrets and helping Iran track protesters in its latest indictment against the Chinese company. Yesterday's move has escalated the U.S. battle with the world's largest communications equipment maker. Now, in the indictment, which supersedes one unsealed last year in federal court in Brooklyn of New York, Huawei Technologies Company was charged with conspiring to steal trade secrets from six U.S. technology companies and to violate a, racket, a racketeering law typically used to combat organized crime. It also contains new allegations about the company's involvement in countries subject to sanctions. Among other accusations, it says Huawei installed surveillance equipment in Iran that was used to monitor, identify and detain protesters during the 2009 anti-government demonstrations in Tehran. However, Huawei responded to the indictment stating the U.S. move is part of an attempt to irrevocably damage Huawei's reputation and its business for reasons related to comp 
competition rather than law enforcement. In a statement, Huawei called the racketeering accusation a contrived repackaging of a handful of civil allegations that are almost 20 years old. Huawei pleaded not guilty to the early indictment unsealed against the company in January last year, which charged it with bank and wire fraud violating sanctions against Iran and obstructing justice. Now in tennis, shocks at the Rotterdam Open continues with the tournament's second seed, Stefano Tsitsipas suffering defeat at the hands of an unseeded opponent. The tournament's first seed was also knocked out the day before. Second seed Stefano Tsitsipas lost 7-5, 6-4 to unseeded Slovenian Aljaz Bedin as upsets continued as the Rotterdam Open yesterday. Although world number 52 Bedin's unforced error count was higher than his opponents, the 30-year-old fired 20 winners which are 8 more than the world number 6. In the meantime, the old French battle between Gay Monfils and Gilles Simon ended with Monfils advancing to the quarter-finals. The third seed recorded a rather uneventful 6-4, 6-1 victory over the world number 57. And that's it from all of us here at First at Nine. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.